in the next hadith, hadith 826, narrated Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to command us to marry and sternly forbid celibacy and say marry women who are beloved due to their good characteristics prolific in bearing children for I shall outnumber the prophets by you on the day of resurrection reported by Ahmed and Ibn Hiban graded it as Sahih uh, the aforesaid hadith has a supporting narration supported by Abu Dawood and Nisa'i and Ibn Hiban from Ma'kul bin ya Yasar's uh, hadith in this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there are immense benefits to be gained and as we mentioned in the prior uh, hadith where the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam mentioned that it is from his sunnah uh, to marry. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Radida and Sunnati Fadaisa Minni, whoever desires other than my sunnah, then they are not from me, meaning they're not uh, from my nation, and that can have different implications depending upon the situation. To what extent someone is departed from the, the sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, in this hadith, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to command us to marry and sternly forbid celibacy. So in this first statement, that uh, the statement of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala, he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to command us to marry. And we, we know that al-amr yufid al-wujub that when there's a command from Allah Azza wa Jal or from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al-Amr Yufid Al-Wujub that the origin of a command is that uh, it necessitates that this is an obligatory uh, action to fulfill and so Anas radiallahu ta'ala he said Allah's Messenger used to command us to marry and what? And then there's a nahi. And sternly forbid celibacy. Sternly. And we know uh, a nahi you feed a tahreem. That a prohibition, you know, something that is, has been, uh, you know, that Allah has prohibited in the Quran or is prohibited in the, in the statement of the Prophet Wasallam in his sunnah then that means it is uh, haram. This is the asl of that nahi. A nahi, you feed a tahreem. So that when there's a prohibition, that the asl of that prohibition uh, is that the action in which it is prohibiting is haram. You cannot do. And here in this statement of Anas, he said, nahiyin shadidin. He said a stern, uh, pro, uh, he prohibited us, he forbade us uh, sternly, sternly forbade celibacy. So the Prophet said, so this was a shadid nahi. So then the fact that it, he mentioned that it was shadid, he didn't mention it was, uh, you know, khafif or, or uh, another way of grading that. Instead, he said it was very stern letting us know that that affirms for us that it was uh, uh, that it was haram you know very, that it's very prohibited Islam discourage discourages intentional celibacy you know for to go one's life and not marry to 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 straight or say they're not going to marry because they're so involved in ibadah or whatever the case may be this goes completely against the son of the Prophet and this hadith affirms the other hadith we mentioned because uh, Anas said he sternly forbade he sternly forbade us from celibacy and he and say meaning the Prophet would say <coughs> marry women 
who are beloved, meaning good uh, according to their good characteristics, they're very beloved, kind, gentle, uh, you know, affectionate, uh, and prolific in bearing children. The second uh, condition the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, and this was about regarding the, the women. Likewise, this does not mean that the men also are, uh, you know, when a, a woman is looking for a, a, a suitor, that she is looking, you know, also she should be observant. Of course, she wants a man with good characteristics. And that should logically be the case with in a line with our fitra, you know, is that someone would want someone who has good manners. He may be handsome, he may be wealthy, but if you see that his religion is weak or that he's from Ahl bidah he's not from Ahl sunnah he's not on the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then those are characteristics that are mithmum that the woman should stay away from. So it's very important to understand and follow this sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and prolific in bearing children. Of course, this is for the, the case of the women. And then the Prophet Sallallahu gave the reason, the illah. He said, for I shall outnumber the prophets by you on the day of resurrection. Uh, so the reason being is the Prophet والسلام, his ummah would be bigger than the prior ummahs that came before us. So the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged us to have children. It's from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do so because as he he commanded this and mentioned this some of the many benefits we gain from this hadith the first is wujub nikah is this hadith uh, is dalil or evidence for the ob uh, obligation of nikah for the obligation uh, to marry and this is in accordance with the statement of the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya'muru bil ba'a the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said uh, uh, or uh, that the statement of Ennis is that he commanded with uh, he commanded us uh, to marry he commanded us to marry and so as we mentioned Al-Amr Yufi the Wujub that a command the Asl Fi Amr Al-Wujub the origin of a command is that it's an obligation. And then likewise, what affirms that hukum is in the same statement. Because then he said that he prohibited us a stern prohibition from uh, celibacy. So this affirms the hukum of marriage being commanded or the obligator the obligation to marry it's affirmed this ruling is affirmed by the second statement because it was strictly prohibited to be celibate well what's the opposite of celibacy the opposite of celibacy is marriage so that shows us that relationship in that ibarra uh that whole statement affirms for us the importance and the obligation to marry And this, of course, is in the case of the one who has the ability to do so. As we mentioned uh, in the first hadith that we studied in this this chapter, Ya Ma'ashar al-Shabaab, Men istata'a minkum, Men istata'a minkum, Alba'a filiyatazawaj. O youth, whoever amongst you has the ability then they should marry, okay? And that lets us know that if someone has the ability, and we mentioned that those abilities are the two types, we said that they are the ability bedania, according to, you know, the, their, their uh, I guess you could say sexual prowess, or their ability to, yeah, their sexual prowess, their ability to have relations. And the second is the ability maliyah 
meaning in accordance with their wealth, their financial ability to be able to take care of a spouse. Another benefit of this hadith, which goes back to the first uh, benefit, that it is, the, it is prohibited celibacy. Celibacy is prohibited in Islam. And we talked about that uh, uh, extensively in, in the past, uh, the prior hadith. And one of the reasons that we also mentioned, two reasons, and also some of those reasons even come in this hadith, the first and foremost, the Prophet said, Men ragaban sunnati fa minni. Whoever uh, desires other than my sunnah is not from me. And we know this is from the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to marry women. So, that's one way or one uh, evidence to show, aside from this also the statement that the Prophet uh, the, the statement of Anas ibn Malik in which he said that the Prophet sternly forbade celibacy. So he sternly forbade celibacy. He also mentioned that from his sunnah is to marry. Okay. And then also that he mentioned in the same hadith that I encourage to have children. And of course, Islam uh, encourages having children in the marital bond and discourages having children outside of the marital bond. Another benefit of this hadith is, and this is a, a fiqh benefit from the fiqh, uh, Imam uh, bin Uthaymin, rahmatullahi he said, He said, also what we draw from this hadith is that a nahi, you know, the prohibition, that it is divided into two, two types. There is the nahi shadid, which is mentioned in this hadith, where Anas ibn Malik said, he sternly forbade. So that's a nahi a shadid, very strong prohibition. Prohibition. And Nahi uh, Khafif would be for Kiraha. Now, you see this a lot of times in the books of Fiqh as you get into your, your studies and especially uh, as you learn Arabic. And if you don't already know, and then you'll go into the books of Fiqh and you'll see, you know, uh, and, and even books of Hadith uh, talking about Karahiya and Nahi. Karaha or Nahi Litahrim. Okay, and this is what we're talking about here, the differences. So Ben Othamim is highlighting from this hadith that this Nahi is of two types. The Nahi uh, Shadid, which means a Nahi Litahrim. The prohibition that something is Muharram. And then a Nahi uh, Khafif, which means that the prohibition is uh, the hukum that results from this prohibition is that it's something makru, meaning it's not haram, but it's disliked. Okay, so that's the two types of uh, prohibitions, and we learn that from this hadith as well. This hadith is dalil for those uh, divisions. Right. The next benefit of this hadith that the Sheikh mentioned, and this goes back to the prior benefit as well. And al awamr wa nawahi tatafadl. That commands in the Sharia and nawahi prohibitions have different levels. Some of it is more stronger than others. Likewise, some of the prohibitions or some of the commands are more than others. And we, we just gave an example that there is nahi li tahrim or nahi li karaha. You know, that there is uh, a, a, a prohibition which shows something is haram and there's a prohibition which shows something is disliked. And likewise, this is the same way with commands. There are commands which show that it's an obligation to do. Wa salat. 
No one's going to debate and say, well, Salat is probably mustahab. It doesn't mean you have to pray. You can pray. It's recommended that you pray. No. No one says that. This is mu'akkit. This hukum, this ruling is sure. And it is, uh, and it is uh, wajib. This shows that this, this command is a very strong command. Allah is commanding you to pray. It's an obligation. There's no debate about it. But then another obligation, or another command, sorry, another command, could mean, could be less than that, and mean uh, something is mustahab. Something is recommended. So it shows us that the commands have different levels, and the prohibitions have different levels. Likewise, the sins have different levels. Sins are divided into, uh, you have sagair wa kabair. You have the minor sins and the major sins. The same way you have shirk. The minor shirk and the major shirk. Minor shirk does not take you out of the fold of Islam. Major shirk takes you out of the fold of Islam. The minor kufr and the major kufr. The minor kufr, uh, you know, is a major sin, but it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam. The major kufr takes you out of the fold of Islam. So it shows us sins have different levels. Our ahkam has different levels, and that's one of the things we learned from this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith, Mishru'iya intiqal mar'a al-wudud al-wudud. This hadith also shows that it is legislated to choose a woman who uh, is good in her manners in religion, and that she, uh, you know, is fruitful in, in that she can be, she can have children. So these are good characteristics, and this is mishroor. Okay, that doesn't mean it's an obligation as far as, uh, you know, perhaps there are, are certain circumstances where a person may not uh, desire ch children or, or maybe it, you know, according to specific circumstances, maybe he's an old man, and his wife is very young, or you know, some some other situation in which uh, perhaps this hukum, or he has some sort of genetic uh, disease that will be passed to the children, or she does. So then it, they married, and they, uh, for medical reasons, don't have children. Whatever the case may be, there are certain s exceptions, but in general. The, it is shows this hadith shows us it is mishroor to choose uh, someone who can uh, have children uh, and that of course that they have good manners and uh, and good in religion very very important another benefit of this hadith this hadith also shows us that uh, the man who marries a woman, and this comes from experience and from uh, perhaps our fitra as well as the shar, but more importantly from this hadith right now, is that the more righteous a spouse you choose, the more happier you will be in your life. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes people marry often they may choose someone who is very handsome. Sister is, you know, she's sprung. She loves a man, he's very handsome. Or a man chooses a woman who's very beautiful. And they might already know this person has shortcomings in their character or in their religion. And they overlook that. The result happens later that they, they're not happy in their life. They're not happy in their marriage. Great difficulty, great strain, unnecessary stress and leading to divorce, after children, before children, sometimes violence, all kind of problems result, and the sunnah has a prescription, uh, a way of trying to reduce those types of scenarios, and that is that from the beginning you choose someone, you choose your mate cautiously. And I know countless and have received countless questions from people regarding these types of issues where 
uh, these marital issues. We have so many, and this, of course, is not unique to any particular culture. Everywhere, I don't care if you're in Pakistan, India, South Africa, uh, 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 Gambia, Senegal, here in Saudi Arabia, America, wherever, these problems, the same problems exist, and divorce is on the rise worldwide in every community, amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. So it's very important to pick a righteous uh, sp uh, spouse, very, very important, and someone who's good in manners and good in deen. And may Allah grant us that. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there's a type of uh, a type of a competitive nature in which, in, uh, between the MBA, you could say, that the Prophet wants to have the, the most in his nation. That, they, that of course, who doesn't want to have the, the, who doesn't and who didn't want to have the most followers to come to be saved from the hellfire. Okay, that's the, the fitra. And this is the, the Prophet wants, you know, to have, and he said, Inni muka Mukathirun bikum, that I will be, you know, have more uh, from amongst them, from amongst the the uh, the nations, the prior uh, prophets. Alayhim afdal salatu wa salam. So it's uh, this is another benefit that we gain from this hadith. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is as we kind of made ishara to, or we mentioned, is that. Uh, this hadith shows us that Islam encourages uh, to have children, to make the ummah stronger, to make the followers of the Prophet ﷺ stronger. Uh, and another benefit of this hadith, a last benefit that we'll mention, is this hadith uh, shows the vigilance of the Prophet ﷺ on... Um, on having a large ummah. That the Prophet ﷺ wanted to have more and more people guided, more and more people born into Islam, coming to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being raised on the Day of Judgment as mu'mineen. Those are just some of the benefits of this hadith of the Prophet wasallam. In the next hadith, Hadith 827 narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam said a woman is married for four qualities for her wealth her family status her beauty and her religion so get the religious one and prosper with the rest of a saba or the rest of the seven hadith collections. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, which is in Kitab and Nikah, the book of marriage, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clarified some of the reasons that a man chooses some of the characteristic a man chooses to marry a woman for and as some of the expl uh, the explainers of this hadith mention that there are uh, 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 many reasons why a man what may motivate a man to marry a particular woman or characteristics he may be looking for. However, these four are the most prevalent and especially in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, they have a relationship, a very strong relationship even to our time as far as these particular reasons 
and that might return to particular cultures and societies. So the Prophet والسلام, said, uh, a woman is married for four qualities, for her wealth, her family status, her beauty, and her religion. Her wealth, for example, you'll find in many, really around the world, that there are some men who desire to marry a wealthy woman because they feel that they will either inherit from her or it will change their lifestyle uh, in their uh, particular society or locality and perhaps even for their status. And so this is not a something which is difficult to understand but some of the people they choose to marry women for their wealth. And for example one thing in societies that have high unemployment where it's difficult for the men to find work uh, and difficult for for everyone to find work but a man may desire to marry a wealthy woman or a woman who works and has provisions and so this is one of the reasons that the Prophet mentioned uh, that is very common that there are many men who desire this type of relationship and that is up to the individuals to determine if that is a the better type of relationship for them or not the second reason the Prophet ﷺ mentioned was that uh, for family status and also likewise this uh, is prevalent around the world but in more tribal societies and traditional societies they look to tribe tribal status for example such and such tribe has more uh, status uh, in Yemen for example compared to another tribe so then someone of a tribe that has lesser status in the eyes of the people not in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in the eyes of the people then they may choose to, sh to seek out someone who has a greater status and in the West we have some of these similar characteristics although the societies are quite different but you still have those elements of someone may want to marry someone who is famous for example an actress or a movie star or of course regarding the Muslims someone uh, may want to marry uh, a famous da'i, someone who calls to Allah, they may want, they may marry them in, in fact for fame. Even it may be a man, he is religious, but he wants a woman who is known that gives da'wah or teaches sisters and she's famous, perhaps. So these are different uh, scenarios in which this plays out and that depends upon the society. So during the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, often they highly regarded and, and in these lands still tribalism is very prevalent so the people look to the tribe and sometimes they often do not marry in between tribes certain tribes will not marry another tribe and they would prefer to even marry someone who is wicked from their tribe than to go outside of their tribe so this shows you the extremeness that can happen with these kind of uh, beliefs when we go go away from the Prophet ﷺ's recommendation, which is the fourth uh, quality or characteristic to marry for. Uh, the third quality the Prophet ﷺ is uh, mentioned uh, is the beauty, and that is well known that. A person desires uh, more more often than not especially men desire a woman who they are attracted to and a woman uh, often the men they desire whether they can get that or not they desire a woman who's has in their eyes uh, extreme beauty so there are many men who traverse who strive to marry a very beautiful women a uh, woman and 
again, when we are excessive in striving for any of these traits, that can often lead us to sinfulness or destruction. So, for example, the man who desires to marry a beautiful woman, and he doesn't care anything about her manners, he doesn't care anything about her deen. He says, I, I know she's a Hindu, I, I, I know that she, uh, uh, you know, is, is very, uh, her behavior is very bad and she has very bad mannerisms, but maybe she'll be guided to Islam, but she is very beautiful, so I am going to strive to marry her one, one way or another. Or even they will marry her and that's something which is uh, impermissible and not legitimized through Islamic practices to marry uh, a Hindu because she's not even from Ahl Kitab. So the point being is sometimes that leads to destruction. Likewise, she may be a Muslim, uh, a, a Muslima, and she may be known for her beauty or known for certain characteristics that the man finds attractive, physical characteristics, but yet again not looking at her manners, not looking at her, her, her religion. And so this is a very dangerous thing and as we go back and look at the hadith we studied prior to this, that we find that one of the uh, commands of the Prophet والسلام, one of the things that he mentioned uh, is marrying for that the ability uh, that she is a, a loving, affectionate, you know, good mannered woman, and also that she is able to have children. That those are some of the reasons the Prophet والسلام, uh, encouraged to uh, us as believers to marry women for those characteristics. So the one who just focuses on beauty, they, oft, uh, they often find themselves at a loss. If they focus just on beauty and they marry someone who is very attractive in their eyes, but yet their characteristics, uh, their mannerisms, their uh, meeting their Islamic rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his creation and to the husband, are they fall short in this, then that man will suffer. And there are countless examples. I know countless individuals who've chosen, who were very starstruck, as we say. They married a beautiful woman from a particular country. They thought it was exotic, and they were so happy for a minute. And then they had great misery uh, for a long period of time and having children, several children, feeling locked and imprisoned in the marriage because they did not investigate her conduct. And they found that she, in fact, maybe had mental illness or that she had the worst of character and conduct and it just caused, uh, causes chaos in the marriage. The fourth characteristic the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, which is the most uh, important characteristic, and the Prophet ﷺ said, <coughs> and her religion, so get the religious one and prosper. So the Prophet ﷺ linked prosperity with the religious one, not with the one who, who uh, was wealthy, not with the one who was uh, just simply beautiful in the eyes of the individual, but rather the Prophet والسلام, said the prosperity, the one who will be in, a, um, who will be, uh, be pleased and happy, is the is, by marrying the one who has good religion. And of course that depends upon the individual, meaning that some individuals, they may uh, choose to marry a woman who's excellent in her deen, but she may not be very attractive to him. And maybe they're fine with that. But sometimes this results, uh, has negative uh, results. Because from the fitra of the men, is that they need that which pleases their eyes. So so it's better, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, and again, this depends upon the individual, but to marry someone who has more than one characteristic that 
uh, you are attracted to. So, for example, she doesn't have to be excessively attractive, but she must be, she's someone attractive to you because she's going to help you lower your gaze. As we mentioned in the first hadith, yeah, when the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, men istata'a minkum al-ba'a faliyatazawaj, the Prophet ﷺ commanded the shabab, the youth, to marry and for those who are, are able to, to marry, meaning that they have the wealth or they have the physical, uh, sexu <laughs> sexual prowess to do so, that they should marry. And, uh, and then he said that it is better for, or it encourages lowering the gaze. Okay, so this is the point, that if you have a woman who's attractive in your household that you, this is your wife and likewise for the woman to be attracted to her husband then this helps them be more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by lowering their gaze because they know that they have someone who's who's uh, helps to comfort their heart when they look at them that they're physically attracted to them because there's a lot of uh, uh, problems that result from not being physically attracted sometimes people their religion is good but yet it's difficulties in a marriage because there's no desire for the other person after some time. So it's very important to strive to have a balance in this regard and during the marriage to maintain physical uh, attraction for one another, to strive to be healthy, to take care of one's body, not let, let yourself get out of shape. And this is for the men and the women. So the Prophet linked prosperity to marrying a religious woman, letting us know that this is what is the best. This is mustahab. You know, this is what is recommended uh, by the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and that we should strive for in following his sunnah. Some of the main benefits of this hadith is this hadith uh, illustrates for us the main reasons men seek out uh, to marry uh, women or the main characteristics men seek out uh, in a woman for marriage and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned four the wealth the status or the uh, basically the status or beauty or her religion the second benefit of this hadith is that there is no problem with a person marrying someone because they are wealthy and they're able to uh, care for them. So some women, they choose that. There's often you find that there are many women around the world that they are just seek seeking economic stability. So they look for a suitor who has wealth or at least can fulfill their needs and some of their wants. So, uh, in relation to this hadith, it shows us that this is permissible to seek out someone who can care for you. And likewise, that the man can seek out a woman who has wealth. That this is a permissible thing. However, the best, of course, is seeking out for the religious reasons. Uh, a third characteristic or a third benefit of this hadith is also that it is uh, it's commonplace and that it is also not necessarily problematic to marry someone for their status that this is also a permissible thing because the Prophet ﷺ did not prohibit these things so that's why it is not for us to make this haram or prohibited a person may say that this is inadvisable maybe someone if you ask someone of knowledge and they say well this is inadvisable because this especially in a particular situation okay so this is why it's important again returning back to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised to do and that is what that is to marry for the religion for the deen the uh, the uh, fourth benefit of this hadith 
is also it shows the permissibility of marrying a woman for her beauty. And we already talked about that, about how this, uh, th that it's important in the marital bond to be attracted. It's very important in the marital bond to be attracted to your spouse because your spouse uh, is going to help you be more obedient to Allah to avoid the muharramat. And especially in this day and age when we have uh, the various forms of social media and the internet and all kind of distractions to distract us from the truth and to distract us from good. There are many evil ways the shaitan comes from us outside of marriage and within a marriage. So it's very important for the believer to safeguard and protect his or herself from the shaitan. And one of the ways that can be helpful is marrying someone who you are attracted to and they are good in their religion. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows that it's permissible to uh, that is permissible and that it is uh, recommended to marry a woman based upon her religion and that is the best as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. Uh, the uh, last benefit of this hadith is that it shows that it is very important and in fact at least recommended if not of course wajib and obligation to follow the advice of the Prophet والسلام, those things he recommended so we should always be cognizant and always be accepting of what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what he advised us with so that's one of the things we get from this hadith because the Prophet وسلم, said so get the religious one and prosper. He linked prosperity with deen and he advised that. You know, he used uh, the, he said, so, you know, therefore, so, get the religious one and prosper. So the, this is a type of command from the Prophet Wasallam. you know, a, a, a type of strong recommendation or a uh, recommendation which would follow under that it is mustahab, that it is uh, recommended to do this and then of course there are many other benefits of this hadith and likewise this hadith shows us that uh, the the four reasons for marrying uh, a woman for choosing a spouse and as we mentioned in the beginning of the hadith there are other reasons in the next hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam congratulated a man on his marriage, he would say, Allah bless for you, your spouse, grant you blessing, and join you together in goodness. Reported by Ahmed and Al-Arba, At-Tirmidhi ibn Khuzayma and Ibn Hiban graded it as Sahih or authentic. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it shows the Islamic way of congratulating someone uh, that has uh, gotten married recently or during their, their marriage or what have you. And the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam being the best of examples, and as we know, we are ordered to follow his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he used to as his his habit uh, congratulate the people with this dua the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say barakallah lak wa baraka alayk wa jama'a baynakuma fil khair so he would say Allah bless you and your spouse, grant you blessing, and join you together in goodness. So here, this supplication 
shows the beauty of Islam that everything that we do as a Muslim related to ibadah is ibadah meaning that everything we do almost all the activities in our lives are governed by something in Islam that has the relationship with bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it all revolves around Tawheed the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone so here even uh, even getting married we supplicate for the person when sneezing we supplicate before having sexual relations you supplicate all of these things you're asking Rabbil Alameen the one who created you the one who sustained you the one who provides for you the one who is the all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-hearing, you're asking Him. And the one who gives guidance, we're asking Him for guidance, we're asking Him for protection, we're asking Him for baraka. And, and, and here, in this supplication that the Prophet Sallallahu used to do, you're asking the person, you're asking Allah to give this person blessing. Barakallah luck. May Allah bless you. What a great way of establishing a bond with a person by actually supplicating for them, showing them a uh, this this uh, showing them that you have concern for them by supplicating to the Lord of the heavens and earth on their behalf. So that establishes the bond between people, and you are asking, you're making a talab from your Lord Subhanahu wa Taala to put blessing on what they're doing. Bless this individual. وَبَرَكَ uh, عَلَيْكَ And, uh, you know, yeah, may Allah bless you, uh, bless your spouse, or bless, bless, uh, give you this blessing and give you your, your spouse this blessing. You know, that, that, that what you have, uh, you know, acquired so to speak your 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 spouse so here you're supplicating for that particular individual and their spouse that Allah puts goodness between them that Allah gives them blessing in this new uh, uniting between those two individuals and then he said wa jama'a bainakuma fil khair and may Allah put between you goodness so you're supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah to bless them, uh, and asking Allah to put goodness between them. Because uh, So this, this is asking, supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them in this life as well as the hereafter. So this is uh, a beautiful supplication, and it is from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet ﷺ used to ask Allah's blessings, blessing, unity, and harmony, and love for the newly married couple. And this is from the beauty of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Some of the main benefits we gain from this hadith is first, that this supplication is mashroor or it is a legislated supplication uh, for the married couple that this is uh, from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is the prophetic way of congratulating someone uh, who has just entered the mar marital bond by supplicating to them and that shows also that that's the best way of doing it. The best way is, of course, it's permissible for you to supplicate for people and supplicate for yourself using your own words. This often we gain our we gain a stronger feeling from that because it's from ourselves, from our heart. This is great. This is khair. But the best is when we can gain those same feelings by understanding those prophetic supplications because he was the best at worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the closest to Allah Azza wa Jal. The second benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows us 
that this supplication is for the uh, the people who have married, even if they have not had relations yet uh, and have not consummated the marriage, even at the time of the uh, they have made the act or the the marital contract, and that uh, you are still supplicating and asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give them blessings in their their new uh, their new life. Another benefit uh, from this hadith is this hadith shows us that what is an Islamic practice and what can be derived, as the ulama mentioned, what practices are un-Islamic, meaning that we have no evidence for, as we find in a lot of other communities, especially amongst the Jews and the Christians, and I don't know about some of the other uh, communities, or especially the Christians I'm familiar with, is that uh, standing up and clapping when the you know for the husband and bride or uh, some other practice that these are practices which are later mishroor. These are practices which are not legislated practices we don't know uh, don't have an origin uh, in Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu laid down his sunnah for us to follow, and from the sunnah is supplicating for that couple, but not standing having standing ovations and clapping and other practices which are not from the sunnah and just as a point is that we find in many muslim communities around the world that they go they do extravagant weddings and they do all of the things that you find at the extravagant christian weddings you know, they follow other com communities. The Prophet ﷺ said, Let You would follow the way of the people who came before you. And he was referring to the Jews and the Christians, especially in shirk. And, 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 uh, but this, even in their habits and ways. The Prophet ﷺ said, Men bikomen minhum. Whoever resembles a people, that he is from them. So it also shows us that it is madhmoon. It is not permissible to do the extravagance and follow the way of those other communities by doing things which are un-Islamic. As we mentioned, the clapping, uh, the mixing in the ceremonies, the even the, the wedding garb, you know, wearing, ha seeing the bride, seeing the bride and the husband together and taking pictures, and the woman is wearing a white gown just like in the, the, the many of the Christian uh, cultures, uh, likewise, all of those things, music, so often you'll find that the Muslims in many, probably every racial group and every culture, whether they're Muslim or not, they have something from these practices or some practices which are ghayra mishroor, which are not from Islam. And so this is why it's very important to stick with the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in all of our uh, especially with regards to anything that's uh, ibadat and also in the mu'amalat to follow that which is legislated uh, in the sharia as long as it's not something which it is permissible to uh, that there's more flexibility in but as far as the habits and so forth then we should we have a beautiful example in the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam another benefit of this hadith is that greetings and these types of ceremonies and so forth should be based upon the Islamic code of conduct, conduct as we mentioned. And if we do that, we find khair and barakah. And khair and barakah were both mentioned in the hadith, both mentioned in that supplication. وَجَمَعَ بَيْنَكُمَا uh, uh, al khair that the Prophet Sallallahu in this supplication said and may Allah bring to bring you together in goodness or bring goodness to both of you you know bring you together in goodness so we find khair in supplicating for khair you know following the Prophetic sun, Sunnah and we find barakah in following the Prophetic Sunnah 
And likewise, in the supplication itself, it mentioned baraka, reward, uh, uh, blessings, and khair, and this goodness. So we find goodness and khair by supplicating uh, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam supplicated. Another last benefit from this hadith, and we kind of touched upon this in the beginning, is that the Islam governs every aspect of our life. Every aspect of our lives. And every aspect in every aspect of our lives we should be seeking to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either if we're doing something mubah then this is something different something that's just permissible eating an apple okay if you eat an apple there's no problem you're using your computer you're doing whatever but those things which have to do with ibadat and mu'amalat that are mentioned in the shara then try to have a, an intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to come closer to Allah and this hadith shows us that even the marital bond the marital ceremony that even by supplicating for the couple that this is a way of seeking to draw near to Allah and asking for Allah to give blessings to others to make their path easier to Allah. So this is in fact a supplication which is a supplication for goodness in this life as well as the hereafter. We'll find that in many supplications that the Prophet Sallallahu didn't leave out this life. Our, li our lives as Muslims is not just only that we only focus on the akhirah and leave everything in the dunya we will leave everything in the dunya but we use the main thing is is that we use the dunya this worldly life to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have success in the akhirah but likewise that does not prohibit some of the things that we can enjoy in this life and benefit from in this life so this hadith shows us the benefit of supplicating and the benefit of supplicating for others and that this is something that brings us good in this life as well as the hereafter as the Prophet ﷺ also used to supplicate as is mentioned Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina thab al as is mentioned in the Quran Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana O our Lord bring us good in this life Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana bring us good in this life so Islam is not left out this life Ufil akhirati hasana and in the hereafter bring us good waqina adhab al-nar and then one of the most important things so here you're asking for good in this life and good in the hereafter and protection from the fire because it's possible that you could have some good some good in this life and some good in the hereafter and still go to the fire for a time for some of the sins that you did that's possible but this dua is uh, encompassing and this is what we find in the supplications of the Prophet ﷺ, that they encompass so much they cover so much of our lives so that they're asking for this uh, supplication is asking for good in this life as well as the hereafter as well as protection from the fire. So then you've covered all grounds. If Allah grants you that supplication, you're protected. You're protected. Likewise, going back to the supplication at hand, this is asking for barakah for someone else in this life as well as hereafter. And we know that when we supplicate for someone else, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially if they are not present, that He, uh, subhana, His angels, will uh, supplicate for uh, the individual who supplicated. So it shows us the importance of du'a in general. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.